Open your Bibles this evening to Matthew chapter 4, verse 1. In keeping with our standard operating procedure, the next few moments are devoted to silent prayer, giving each of you the privacy of your priesthood to name your sins to God. If we name our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to purify us from all wrongdoing. When we name our sins to God, we are filled with God the Holy Spirit. God the Holy Spirit is our mentor and our teacher and the one who brings to our memory those things we have forgotten. God is spirit and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and biblical truth. So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, let us pray. Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege to assemble ourselves together for the purpose of learning the Word of God. May God the Holy Spirit enlighten us to the things that we note and give us the concentration necessary to assemble this portion of the Word into our souls. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen. Now I was reading an article today uh, concerning something of current events in which, of course, all of us know that we're at war right now. And it says there is heavy military recruitment at high schools. And then the, the title, actually the title of the article says, Heavy military recruitment at high schools irks some parents. Well, you don't know how, uh, how much to believe of that. How many is some parents, too? They went out and find, found two parents that said, oh, we don't like all of these military recruiters here, and then made a big story out of it. But it is a big story. And it's from Washington, a little-known provision in the No Child Left Behind Act that compels public high schools. They're public. How do you compel something public? I mean, it's just like the military's public. A little-known provision in the No Child Left Behind Act that compels public high schools to open their doors and pupil records to military recruiters has some parents, student, students, and anti-war groups up in arms. Well, this just shows a lack of patriotism. And, uh, well, the reason why they're doing such heavy recruitment today is because we don't have a draft, and they need these people to join the military in order to fight our foreign wars. And it seems as if, if this uh, had been, if this story had been created, you see the date is June 23rd, 2005. If this story had come out on September 12th, 2001, well, that they would have crucified the paper for making such a fallacious story. And so we see how we forget 9-11 and all of those things. And uh, military recruitment in public high schools is something that happened when I was in school, and it, it's nothing new, really. And I think they're just complaining at anything out of their, well, the media is not patriotic. And so beware of some of the articles you read or see on the news. But the fact is uh, the people do need to join the military as per freedom through military victory. And there's an excellent book on that written by Colonel R.B. Thame. It should be over there somewhere if you want to grab it and read it on the way out to see how we do and must win wars. You see, when you have freedom, you have to fight for it because freedom is not free. And all of that is uh, listed in that book, which is very good. And it tells how, in fact, when we go to war, it is moral to kill the enemy, not immoral, and actually a righteous thing to do. And uh, the military is the most honorable profession anyone could uh, go into. Now, you don't have to because it's not part of our law, but it would be the honorable thing to do. I never did, but it is an honorable profession. Now, that's just an aside as part of what's going on today, but now let's take a look at Matthew chapter 4, verse 1. And before we look at that, we're going to have to have an introduction regarding the doctrine of kenosis. And kenosis is K-N-O-S-I-S. K-E-N-O-S-I-S. -E K-E-N-O-S-I-S. Kenosis. Not epinosis and not gnosis, as in G-N-O-S-I-S. -S. This is a separate doctrine, kenosis. And the origin of this doctrine uh, begins with a Greek word, kenoo, K-E-N-O-O. -O. And that word means to empty oneself or to deprive oneself of a proper function. This word is found in Philippians chapter 2, verse 7. Actually, it starts out right there at Philippians chapter 2, verse 7, where it says, 
but deprived himself. And uh, of course, this is the word kanoo. And that means our Lord deprived himself of the proper function of deity. Remember, Jesus Christ was born into the world having humanity and deity. That's part of the hypostatic union. Humanity and deity existed in one person, but deprived himself of the proper function of deity by taking on the inner essence or the form of a servant. Although he had been born in the outward image of mankind by appearing as a man. That means when you looked at Jesus Christ, he appeared as 100% man. The fact is he was 100% man. And there are heresies that say he has some uh, supernatural form of a body. And I believe uh, we'll study that in a minute. But there, those are some of the heresies related to it. But the fact is he was 100% man and 100% God all in one person. By taking on the inner essence, form of a servant, although he had been born in the outward image of mankind by appearing as a man. And then in verse 8 it says, he humbled, he humbled himself. You see, uh, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And in eternity past, Jesus Christ was the Son of God. And he had not taken on humanity yet, but he was the Son of God as per the Trinity. And having that position meant he had the position of God all through eternity past. So suddenly, when he came to the earth, he humbled Himself. So there's nothing wrong with humility. In fact, it's the only way we can live our spiritual life. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross, and that's the substitutionary spiritual death on the cross. And that is what Philippians 2.7 and 2.8 tells us, and that begins the doctrine of kenosis from that word kenoo. So we have, uh, as, point of, as part of some principles, the true humiliation of the Incarnation. The Incarnation is Jesus Christ as humanity and as deity, all functioning in one body, yet separated. And we have some cards up there if you want to look at it, uh, dealing with uh, the hypostatic union. I think there's, there's some of those that are laying down up there, and you can grab one on the way out, dealing with the hypostatic union in which there is the God-man, true humanity, and also God in one person. So point one, during the dispensation of the hypostatic union, the incarnation, our Lord Jesus Christ voluntarily restricted the independent use of his divine attributes in compliance with the Father's plan for the Incarnation and the First Advent. Once again, during the dispensation of the hypostatic union. And you say, what's that? That's the 33 years that our Lord lived on the earth incarnate as the God-man, both God and man in one person. Our Lord Jesus Christ voluntarily restricted. He still could have used divine power. He still could have tapped into it but he voluntarily restricted it, voluntarily restricted the independent use of his divine attributes so that he would be in compliance with God the Father's plan. And God the Father's plan was for him to live a unique spiritual life called the prototype. He developed, well, God the Father developed the spiritual life. He lived and proved it and said, yes, this spiritual life works, and then he passed it on to us. And while he lived in that spiritual life, never once did he rely on his deity. And you say, well, what about the miracles? The miracles were performed from the power of God the Holy Spirit. We have the power of God the Holy Spirit, except we do not have the gift of miracles. Jesus Christ did, and the apostles did. We don't. We don't need it. It was used at that time so that uh, prophecy would be fulfilled and people would recognize him as the Messiah because uh, the miracles like that had never been performed before. And so now they're seeing uh, people being resuscitated from the dead. And so they would all say, well, this must be the Messiah that was prophesied. That's why God the Holy Spirit allowed that. But he still wasn't functioning from deity, always from his humanity. And we've been given the same unique spiritual life. And that's one of the reasons why he never separated himself 
into using a deity. We'll see that in Matthew chapter 4, 1. Point two, this means that Jesus Christ did not use the attributes of his divine nature to benefit himself. He never used his attributes of divine nature to benefit himself. Now just think, uh, you're Jesus Christ and you have all of this power. If somebody irritates you, what are you going to do? Probably turn them into a toad. And from divine power, you could actually do that from divine power if you had it. And from divine power, when Satan would tempt you, well, you could turn him and everything else into gingerbread and begin to eat it while you're hungry. Well, divine power would actually allow him to do so. But since he wanted to follow God's plan, he never used his deity. He relied on his humanity. And in the same way, we must rely on our unique spiritual life, the same one he had being passed down to us. So he never uh, used it to benefit himself, never used it to uh, glorify himself. Well, just imagine what a fireworks show our uh, Lord could put on from deity. And if he wanted to impress somebody, just flick his fingers and it would be the greatest lightning show you've ever seen, all from deity. But he never did that. He always functioned under humanity, utilizing the prototype spiritual life. Because if he would have in the prototype spiritual life, used his deity, that would mean that in our spiritual lives we would, be, ha, must, we would have to, because of precedence, be given the same power. So all of us would have that same power, and you could see the chaos that would occur because of that in our sin natures. Now, Jesus Christ never did so, never used that. He only used the unique spiritual life, and he never acted independently of the protocol plan of God for him. There was a protocol plan for Jesus Christ. We've been given the, the or there was the prototype given to Christ. We've been given the protocol. Now, one compromise of the human nature of uh, Jesus Christ, it wasn't a compromise, but something did occur one time, and that was the transfiguration. And in the transfiguration, uh, Jesus Christ uh, did show his glory to the disciples there, one of whom was Peter. And also Elijah and Moses were there to witness it. But all of that was a fulfillment of prophecy. And all of that had to be done. But he never used it to benefit himself. This was just the transfiguration uh, showing himself as he would be in glorification. Yet the humanity of Christ during the hypostatic union had not yet been glorified. So to resist all the temptations that our Lord uh, received, and he received all the temptations we receive multiplied by about 500. He received all types of different temptations, the same that we do, yet he never used his divine nature to solve the problem. He always used the divine solution in the prototype spiritual life. We have the protocol. So he had to use the four mechanics of the prototype spiritual life. He had to use the two power options, the three spiritual skills. He used eight problem-solving devices. Of course, he did not use rebound or occupation with Christ. He only needed to use eight. And that's what he used on the earth. And we use exactly the same things except with two problem-solving devices added, rebound and occupation with Christ. During the dispensation of the hypostatic union, those 33 years when our Lord lived on the earth, our Lord Jesus Christ voluntarily restricted the independent use of his divine attributes in compatibility with his own objectives and purpose in living among men with their limit limitations. You see, uh, we have limita limitations as being mankind. And he established in his humanity a spiritual life which sets the precedent for the church age. Just as if you walk into a courtroom and you are on trial for anything, there's a precedence for it. There's a precedence for, well, if you committed murder in the state of South Carolina, and it was heinous enough, whatever that means, but if it is, the precedence is you get fried in the electric chair. That's the precedence. And so if you commit murder and uh, are found guilty, the precedence would be under such uh, heinous crimes as these, you would fry in the electric chair. And that would be uh, following the function of good jurisprudence as related to good precedence. And our Lord set a precedence. 
his precedence was, hey, I'm going to live a spiritual life in which I will use the two power options, the filling of God, the Holy Spirit, and Operation Z. And our Lord actually used Operation Z. You should know these terms by now. In which he uh, grew in grace and in knowledge through perception, metabolization, and application of the Word of God. And our Lord Jesus Christ did so the same way we do. The only difference with our Lord in his spiritual life is that he never went into carnality. Such thoughts would be blasphemous. He never sinned, not once. Doesn't mean he wasn't tempted, he was. He was tempted in every way, even more so than we will ever be tempted. Yet he never sinned. He always resisted the temptation from his prototype spiritual life. So he lived that as if he were testing uh, an airplane, uh, testing the prototype of an airplane or a F-16 or some jet that had been created. And he took it up and he flew it and he realized it would endure anything. And he took it up 30, 40, 50 Gs and it handled it just fine. And so he said, yes, this prototype works. I pass it on to you. It's been passed on to you and for you it works as well. And you won't pull 50 Gs like our Lord did, but you might go as far as 10 Gs under evidence testing and you'll be able to handle it just as our Lord handled it with 50 Gs. So he had to set a precedence. And if his precedence had ever used deity, in other words, if he had ever just uh, latched on to deity as a problem-solving device, if he had a temptation in his life and suddenly he zapped that temptation and destroyed it from his deity, he would not be following the prototype and, uh, well, that, that would follow suit from precedence that if he could do that, we too should be able to do the same thing. But he didn't do that. And uh, the thought is almost blasphemous, but I have to say it for your understanding of the fact that he never used his deity for his own benefit. Jesus Christ gave up the independent exercise of his divine attributes only during the dispensation of the hypostatic union. He didn't do so before, nor will he do so afterwards. Only during the 33 years he was on the earth did he limit his use of his divine attributes. Doesn't mean he lost them. There's heresy that says where well, our Lord just, uh, he didn't have them in his humanity. He didn't really even have uh, all of deity. As some of the heresies say he only had part of deity, that part that kept the world in order and everything else, all of which is heresy. He had it. He just limited it. And that's found in Philippians 2.7. And these heresies arise because they're ignorant of Scripture. Philippians 2.7, But deprived himself, he himself, Jesus Christ, deprived his deity and said, I will not use it for these 33 years I'm on the earth because I'm setting a precedence. And since I'm setting a precedence, I must do it exactly right, exactly the way God the Father designed it. And if I don't, then, well, actually world history wouldn't be here today. Everything would have fallen apart. But instead, he did, and that's why we're here. So he independently gave up the exercise of his divine attributes during the hypostatic union only. And now, he didn't give up his attributes. That would be heresy. So during the dispensation of the hypostatic union, our Lord veiled the pre-incarnate glory of his deity. You, you see, he veiled his glory. If Jesus Christ had come down in deity and had not veiled his deity, the glory would have been, well, everybody would have recognized he was a supernatural and the glory of our Lord would have shone around everywhere. He would have had a, a, an intense glow around him, around him, such as the bright light that the shepherds saw when they were terrified. And the glory couldn't be hidden when you have the glory of God. But instead, he independently decided to hide that glory. And even though he was God, the Son, he hid the glory. He humbled himself. He humbled himself to the point where he would appear as a man. Didn't have to, but did it out of love for us. So that, first of all, we could be saved. And secondly, so that we could live the protocol spiritual life. So during the dispensation of the hypostatic union, our Lord veiled the pre-incarnate glory of his deity by giving up the outward appearance of God and voluntarily taking on himself the form of a man. And the glory of Christ, therefore, was veiled, but it was never surrendered. 
It was there, and he could have made the choice and said, I will, be, uh, I will use my deity today. He could have made the choice, but he didn't because it would have been wrong, and it wouldn't have resulted in our salvation, and Satan would have won. Either way, it would have been a mess. So this glory was temporarily revealed, however, as I said, on the Mount of Transfiguration and at Gethsemane, and that was just a flash of his glory. And when uh, Peter and all of those uh, apostles and disciples at the time saw that, they were astonished, and they were terrified when they saw it. Of course, it was the glory of God the Son being revealed for a short time as God the Father had designed it. And it had to occur uh, to fulfill prophecy. So that at that point, uh, God the Father allowed it. But it wasn't for his benefit. It was there to, well, actually it was there to wake up uh, all, all the disciples and say, look here, listen to him. Because then uh, Peter went off on a tangent and said, oh, wow. There is the Lord Jesus Christ transfigured, and there is Elijah, and, uh, and there are all the, the Old Testament saints. Let's build tent for them and so that they can come down and spend the night with us. You see, he was thinking in human terms, so he could run around and talk about how he spent the night with Elijah, although he had been spending the night with the Lord Jesus Christ since he had been with him. But you see, that's the way human viewpoint goes. But Peter grew up later and became a great apostle. And there's grace in that. All of us need to grow up spiritually. So that was the only time where he temporarily revealed his glory. And it astonished everyone who saw it. So even though the humanity of Christ in hypostatic union, that means in his incarnation, and we haven't went over the hypostatic union in, in detail. We will have to in this study since it deals so extensively with the birth of Christ. But uh, for you to just get an overview of it, I suggest you pick up one of them things on the uh, shelf up there and uh, take it with you and study it, in which it's the deity and humanity in one person uh, yet uh, uh, separated to where he would not use it and so even though the humility of Christ in hypostatic union was uh, perfect and impeccable, impeccable means it was perfect and unchangeable, nevertheless the deity of Christ was united with unglorified humanity. So it was united in one body, but Jesus Christ voluntarily separated it. You see, the humanity and deity of Christ were in one body. His deity was in his human body. But he never used his deity for his benefit. And we can just think about it and see all the problems that would have occurred if he had. And we'll see that from Matthew 4.1. So this is called the doctrine of the humility of Christ in that he had to humble himself. And for you to learn the word of God, it takes humility. Because within scripture, you will be reproved and you will be corrected. And a lot of times, people don't like to get their toes stepped on. But I'm reproved and corrected. Everyone is. The point is, do you have enough humility to take it and say, yes, I'm wrong in that area. I need to change. Or I need to stop doing what I've been doing. I need to rebound and get moving. I need to stop being arrogant. I need to stop worrying about things. I need to do this. I need to do that. All of us have our specific area of weakness and when, in which we have to change. And when something from Scripture steps on our toes, we must be humble about it. Because just think, Jesus Christ was humbly, humble enough to go to the cross on our behalf. He wouldn't have been able to do it without humility. He wouldn't have been able to hang on the cross and bear the sins of all the world without humility. Humility. It took a humility we cannot comprehend because he could have reacted to one of the terrible sins of history. He could have reacted to the sins of Hitler or the sins of Stalin or the sins of Osama bin Laden. And, he, and you see, he was judged for those sins too. And he could have said, no, I'm tired of dying for this sin of murder. I'm jumping off the cross from my deity. He could have done it. He could have made the choice, but he chose not to, and it took humility. And it's the same type of humility that you must use in your spiritual life, except our humility is related to our sin nature and having to adjust to the certain flaws that we develop in life or the certain uh, trend of the sin nature in which, in which we have to resist sin up until the point of blood, which occurs once you go far enough in the spiritual life. So while the deity of Christ was united in perfect 
a true humanity, he was still subject to temptation. So even though Christ was perfect, doesn't mean he wasn't subject to temptation. Because remember, Adam was created perfect. But he was subject to temptation. And Adam, in perfection, succumbed to temptation. And in Adam all die, but in Christ shall all be made alive. So Christ, too, being perfect, could have succumbed to temptation. But he never did. So he's subject to temptation, uh, subject to weakness, subject to pain, subject to sorrow. We'll see this when we study the weeping of Christ. And he was subject to the limitation that we have. You see, Christ was in deity, omnipresent, everywhere in deity, omnipresent. Uh, but in his humanity, he was at one place at one time. He had to limit himself. Therein lies the truth of the humiliation of the first advent. So he solved these problems not from his deity, but from the unique spiritual life, the same one we have. And that should wake you up to something tremendously phenomenal, that we have the same thing our Lord used. And he, and he took it all the way to the cross. We won't be able to. We have a sin nature but we can resist a lot of temptation and we can certainly resist a lot of testing and not resist it, but pass it. And we can pass a lot of testing and move on in our spiritual lives and grow to maturity and pass evidence testing. And for us, it's not so burdensome. That's because our Lord took on most of the burden. And for us, we just uh, follow in his footsteps. It's like if it snows two feet, which it never does here, but if it were to snow two feet deep, and if you've ever walked in deep snow, you know how tiring it gets very shortly. I did it as a fat man a couple years ago. And it's very hard to walk in deep snow after a while. Even just walking up to your door is tough. So what I would do is let Dallas walk in front of me. <laughs> then what you do is you just follow the footsteps. And that becomes much easier. Not as easy as walking on dry land, but much easier because you see someone else made the path for you. Jesus Christ has made the path for us. So it makes it easy for us to, well, to be not so burdensome. So the spiritual life is not burdensome. And the spiritual life is definitely not legalism. Because in legalism, uh, they pile up on your back, which we will study later in detail, all of these burdensome taboos. Taboos that no man would be able, ever able to keep. No man. Not even they themselves do, but they justify their sins. Oh, I did it, but I had a right to do it, they'll say. And then, or I had a right to be jealous, or I had a right to gossip because I was warning someone else about the hideousness of that other person. So they uh, function in that manner, and they uh, pile up loads of heavy burden on the people of their congregation. And then when they fall under it, instead of lifting them a helping hand, as grace would do, they stomp all over them and gossip malign and judge them and destroy them and say, look what a sinner they are. Well, who's not a sinner? You creeps. But that's what they are, creeps. And they make the spiritual life, they try to make it burdensome. It's not. Jesus Christ made it easy for us. And while it might not be easy to come in and listen every a night for an hour for you, well, it, it really should be. If, you if your motivation's in the right place, it should be. And it's because all you do is listen to me give you the message, and then God the Holy Spirit takes the information and uh, makes it perspicuous, understandable to you, so that you can understand spiritual phenomena, and then you walk out of here knowing more doctrine than when you came in. Very easy, very simple. And that's the way our Lord designed it. So the glorification of the humanity of Christ, the humanity, was not completed until he was resurrected and ascended and then seated at the right hand of the Father. And when he was resurrected, ascended, and seated at the right hand of the Father, then his humanity was glorified. So not only now is uh, Jesus Christ glorified in deity, he's also glorified in humanity because he followed the Father's plan. And so Jesus Christ right now sits at the right hand of the Father, glorified. And what does the King of kings and Lord of lords need? What does every king need? He needs a royal family, and we are his third royal patent, and we become 
His royal family when we believe in Christ. And as royal family, we follow in the footsteps of the king. And we must learn the protocol uh, that he taught us. He taught us, he lived the prototype of being king. We follow the protocol of being royalty. <clears throat> so the essence of our Lord's deity is composed of the sum total of his divine attributes. So that a change of an attribute would necessarily, would necessarily, meaning it would have to, it would have to involve a change of essence. So if you were to change a part of God's attributes, it would result in a change of his essence. Yet we know from Scripture, Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Jesus Christ has never changed, not in his deity, never changed. And so uh, the idea that uh, he uh, limited, or that God the Father himself limited the deity that he had on the earth, would be heresy because he was the same yesterday, today, and forever. So he was not limited in anything except voluntarily. And he voluntarily limited himself in his deity, which shows humiliation. And if he didn't have to voluntarily do it, he wouldn't have to be humbled. It would just be the way it was. So that heresy really doesn't follow logic, but it's out there today among uh, most congregations. But I'll tell you the truth, most congregations don't teach a kenosis anymore. But when they used to get involved in theology in the olden days when uh, pastors were interested in theology, oh, well, they would read all about kenosis, the doctrine of it. And some of them didn't have all the scriptures, so their doctrine of kenosis would say, well, he didn't function in his deity because God the Father limited him. Yet from Philippians, we see that he limited himself. Jesus Christ limited himself. And that has to do with the true concept of kenosis. No divine attributes were transferred to his humanity. That is, while he was in his humanity, no divine attributes were transferred to him. It's like a line, a division. It's like here's uh, Jesus Christ's body, and then a uh, part of it inside of him is deity. The other part, humanity. And deity never crossed into his humanity. Now, as I said, he could, uh, he could produce miracles from the filling of God the Holy Spirit. We, too, have the filling of God the Holy Spirit, but he doesn't give us the gift of miracles. The Apostle Paul had the filling of God the Holy Spirit, and he temporarily had the gift of miracles so that people could recognize him as an apostle. You see, they didn't have scripture back in those days, so there was uh, no way for them to look at someone and say, well, they're teaching scripture. Well, you see, today you could compare and contrast Scripture. And you could hear somebody today say, you must invite Christ into your heart, and then just pick up your Scripture and look through it and say, well, this guy is making up stuff because it's not in here, because we have Scripture. But in those days, if somebody were to stood, stood up and said, invite Christ into your heart, well, they wouldn't know if they were speaking the truth or not unless they could recognize them as an apostle. So one of the ways God the Holy Spirit made it possible for them to be recognized as an apostle was so that uh, when someone like the apostle Peter would walk through a crowd, somebody would touch the hem of his garment and boom, they would be healed. Now they weren't healed because they touched the hem of their garment. What happened was in their own minds, they limited their healing. You say they could have thought in their minds, if I just look at Peter, I'll be healed. And they would have been but they would limit it, just as they did with our Lord. And they would say, I must go up and touch his hymn to be healed, and they would. But then we see from the centurion in Matthew that when he was, his daughter was very ill, when she was going to be healed, well, he talked to the Lord and said, my daughter is ill, come heal her. Well, he didn't say come heal her, he said heal her. And then our Lord said, all right, uh, take me to where she is and I'll heal her. And he says, no, no. Uh, you can do it from right here. You're the son of God. You can heal her right here if you want to. Because you see, I'm a centurion and I have people under me and I'm constantly telling people what to do in my service. And I don't want to tell you, the son of God, what to do so, or to come into my house on my order. And from his humility, he said, and from his faith, by the way, he said, just heal her now and she'll be healed. And Jesus Christ did it right there. Why? Because the guy believed it. He had enough faith to believe that that could occur. 
And then Jesus uh, complimented him and said, there's no faith like that in Israel, and he's not even an Israeli. He's a Roman centurion. So uh, the reason why it was limited in that way was from their own minds they limited it. And there was nothing special about the hem of the garment. There was something special about the gift of healing, but not the hem of the garment. And it just occurred that way out of their own limitation in their own mind. So the essence of the Lord's deity, as I said, is composed of the sum total of his divine attributes, and none of those were transferred into his humanity. Inf infinity, therefore, and this is logical, infinity, that is God, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit in their deity are infinite. Now the humanity of Christ, in the, was not infinite, not in eternity past. There was no humanity of Christ until the hypostatic union. Now there will always be a humanity of Christ. But it wasn't infinite in the past. It's infinite into the future, but not into the past. So, in, so you must look at a deity as infinity as it is. So invin infinity cannot be transferred into the finite without destroying infinity. So if you were to take the deity of Christ, as so many uh, congregation not congregations, but denominations do, if you were to take the deity of Christ and shove it and make it work and just shove it into the humanity of Christ, well, you're shoving <coughs> infinity into finity because uh, Jesus Christ and his humanity is finite in the past, infinite toward the future. But you can't do that, and it's, that's just logical. So the attributes of deity cannot bleed into humanity and the attributes of humanity cannot bleed into deity. So to rob God of one single attribute would destroy his divine nature. And uh, that's what Christ did not do. So to rob the humanity of Christ from a single attribute of humanity would destroy his humanity. So if the humanity of Christ would have suddenly started acting upon his deity, it would have destroyed his humanity. It would have destroyed our chances of salvation. And of course, we could uh, never even think of a spiritual life because we would never even be saved. Because if he would have ever once used his humanity and said, I will now take my humanity and employ deity into it, it would have destroyed his humanity. Just as if deity would have transferred, or if uh, deity, if you... If humanity transfers into deity, it would destroy deity. That is, if you were to took, take away the infinite aspects of deity. Now, this brings us down to the verse that we're studying. And that was a background of it because it's very important to understand what is about to happen. So, in Matthew chapter 4, verse 1 through 10. Matthew chapter 4, verse 1 through 10. Now this is the true doctrine of kenosis. It's illustrated by the humanity of Christ in his facing of evidence testing. This is where our Lord is facing his evidence testing at age 30, just about around age 30. And there were three tests, and in all three tests, he utilized the power of the world provided by the omnipotence of the Father and by the power of the Spirit. And remember, the filling of God, the Holy Spirit, is a part of a staying power. And he used this power. And this first test that he receives, the first test of his evidence testing from Satan, uh, well, it really brings out the concept of kenosis. The fact that his deity is separated uh, from his humanity in that our Lord's humanity could not use deity to be a problem solver. In the first test, test in Matthew 4, 3 through 4, Jesus had gone 40 days without food and was extremely hungry. And so this begins his test. So in 4, 1, it says this, Then, and then here means it's a chronolog uh, chronological thing. That means that right after Jesus Christ had uh, been baptized, immediately afterwards, he was led by the Holy Spirit into the wilderness to be tested. And this means that there would be a certain points in time when Christ would be tested. Three of these are recorded. Whether there were more, there may have been. They just weren't recorded. But three of the tests 
that our Lord would have to endure from Satan were recorded. And the first one uh, definitely brings out kenosis. To be tested by the devil. After he fasted, what's that mean? And some people might think, uh, fast. And I've heard a lot of people get very self-righteous about fasting and say, today I fasted for my Lord and I didn't eat all day long. Well, this fasting has to deal with well, let's say you have a Bible class. Well, let's say you lived back in those days. Let's say you lived in the days of the Apostle Paul. And he would hold Bible class uh, maybe half a day. He might even go on for 15 hours. That's the way he was. And people would have to sit and listen to his message for hour after hour after hour. And then 12 o'clock would come around and they would start to get hungry but they would deprive themselves of food to keep hearing doctrine. That was the concept of fasting. The concept of fasting had to do with you're hungry, but the Word of God is more important than food, so you're going to take it in. And in, in, in Christ's case, he did a lot of meditating on the Word of God, which he had to know and he did know. And so during those 40 days, he meditated on the Word of God, didn't even take time to eat because he was in a desert, didn't want to run back to the city, was busy being tested, and it was part of his evidence testing, so he didn't eat. That's what fasting is related to. It's, it's as if you come in here on Sunday morning at 10 o'clock and you haven't had breakfast, and you're hungry. Well, you're coming to Bible class, and you could have stayed at home and ate, but instead you chose to come to Bible class. Well, you can say, I'm fasting. But don't do it. You'll sound like an idiot. Really, you're just learning the Word of God. And that's what all the fasting had to do with. didn't have to do with any type of self-sacrifice in which, uh, for example, tomorrow if I decided not to eat all day, that somehow I would be holy. Not at all. You can decide not to eat all day and be filled with all types of sins of self-righteousness and think you are just the it of it all when you're not. You're out of fellowship and you're just starving yourself, you idiot. But it's related to learning the Word of God. And if in those days, well, I guess they took it a bit more serious, especially in the Apostle Paul's day, uh, because uh, he would teach on and on and on and on and on, and people would listen and sit there and miss meals. Pretty phenomenal when you think about it. How many of you would uh, like to miss meals and listen to the Word of God for four or five hours? Not very many. But I think uh, one hour a day will suffice, because uh, my voice wouldn't if it went any like that it's impossible some people are just uh, made different after he fasted 40 days and 40 nights he was very hungry now that's not the it of very hungry doesn't even begin to explain going without food for 40 days in fact in uh, physiologically there's a time when you start to starve yourself that you'll go through a period in which uh, you lose your appetite and you really aren't hungry after a certain amount of time and then suddenly after you've gone for so long you receive some of the worst hunger pains ever you can't even imagine it and one time I was in Houston and watching they have a small Holocaust Museum there and there was a, a 14 year old who was in the concent concentration camp there and he said that uh, it, most 14 year old guys uh, think about girls and to think about their love life and think about uh, other things and such as uh, what they're going to do in life. But when he was in the concentration camp, they would all sit around and talk about food, bread, soup, any type of food. They were starving to death. That was all that was on their mind constantly. That was the point where our Lord had gotten to. He was so hungry. Well, uh, for us, that is all we would be able to think about. But our Lord, from the sustaining power of God the Holy Spirit, was still thinking about doctrine and disregarded the hunger pains, which was a part of his evidence testing, but was also a, a type of foretelling of the cross because even more pain would come then and he would have to disregard that pain. So he was very hungry. Then the one who constantly tempts and this temptation has to deal with the relationship of the unique spiritual life uh, to, well, Satan was trying to get Jesus Christ in this temptation to uh, let go of his humanity 
and grab on to the deity. In fact, he was trying to get Jesus from his humanity to reach over and say, all right, I'm hungry, stones into bread. And if he would have done so, it would have canceled out the cross because it would have destroyed his humanity. And the precedence wouldn't have been set and following precedence, we too, when we get hungry, instead of uh, working for our food, could just say, uh, pulpit, bread, boom, there it would be. But we can't do that. And neither could Christ, because he was living the prototype spiritual life. So this temptation from Satan is, exact, is exactly regarding kenosis, trying to tempt Jesus uh, so that he would forsake uh, the spiritual life and use deity. Then he said to him, Since you are the Son of God, this is a first class condition in the Greek, which means since you are the Son of God, and you are. And there's no doubt in Satan's mind that he's the Son of God. Satan knew he was the Son of God, and he wasn't going up saying, If you are the Son of God. Uh, both Jesus Christ and Satan uh, knew each other a, a long time before this occurred. And they, they uh, in fact, uh, uh, Satan, before he fell, uh, was uh, part of the guardian in heaven, one of the highest ranking angels. And then when he fell, he became an adversary. So Jesus Christ and, uh, well, Satan, they knew each other. So since you are the Son of God, and you are, command these stones to become bread. This was a temptation for Christ after being uh, so hungry with extreme, extreme hunger pain a definite temptation, as it would be a temptation for uh, us, except we would succumb to it. He would not. And so he had extraordinary hunger pains. And so then Satan comes along and says, since you're the son of God, go ahead and turn these stones into bread. Satisfy yourself. And Jesus Christ could have done so from his volition. And he could have said, all right, stones into bread. In fact, if... Uh, if he could have used his deity, well, if, if our Lord Jesus Christ wasn't going to follow God's, the Father's plan for him, he could have gotten very sarcastic with Satan and said, oh, you think you're so big and bad? I won't turn these stones into bread. I'll turn you into a big bread muffin. Poof. He could have done it from his deity. And then Satan might have changed his tune and said, whoa, whoa, whoa wait a minute. <laughs> But then again, Satan knew that he had to uh, tempt Lord in this way, and, and he probably knew he wouldn't. He was going to try all he could, but he probably knew he had no chance. But maybe in arrogance, he thought he might, could have had a chance. So from his deity, he did not even uh, try to turn the uh, stones into bread. This is part of kenosis. Instead, he utilized what we have, the two power options. He utilized the filling of God, the Holy Spirit. He utilized the perception, metabolization, and application of Bible doctrine. By this point, he had perceived and metabolized enough that he was using strict application of doctrine. So he could use now the Word of God along with the sustaining power of God the Holy Spirit. Guess what? You've got that. You've got the filling of God the Holy Spirit. You can receive over time the doctrines of Scripture. The same thing our Lord had. Isn't that amazing? And he also used the three spiritual skills, four spiritual mechanics, the, ten pro the eight problem-solving devices for him. So at this point, he had to rely on plus H, sharing the happiness of God. And while he was starving, he was happy. And he had to be in order to pass this test. And he passed it hands down. Because then we see in verse 4, but he, Jesus Christ, told him, it stands written, man must not live for bread alone, and that is the corrected translation, for bread alone. And that's because bread is a mere detail in our life. Now, we need it for logistical grace support, and we eat it, but it really is a detail of life. And so he says, man must not live for bread alone, but for every word that comes from the mouth of God. So our Lord derives strength from where? The Word of God. Every word that comes from the mouth of God. What is every word that comes from the mouth of God? Your Bible. Now you have to know what it says. And if you don't have the gift of pastor teacher, and if you haven't studied long enough, you see, before I studied long enough, no matter what gift you have, if you don't study, 
uh, you'll never uh, come to be able to put it together. And you could, uh, as a spiritual baby, read the whole Bible. Nothing wrong with it. Of course, it would probably be recommended to learn all of those wonderful stories and to uh, read all the Bible and familiar, familiarize yourself with certain scriptures and certain promises that you can claim. But uh, you can't just pick up the Bible, read it all, and then no dispensations. You have to learn a system, the system of theology. And just as a med the medical field has a system, and you have to learn a vocabulary, so in interpreting the Word of God, it has a system, and you must learn a vocabulary. And if you have the gift, by the time you reach a spiritual self-esteem, you'll know what it is. But it may not function. You may go for years knowing your gift, but it doesn't function. And then uh, when you reach spiritual maturity, God might just shove a door open for you. And if he never does, well, and you have that gift, maybe nobody wants to listen to you. So you do something else and receive double blessing for whatever you do. So you just wait on the Lord when it comes to spiritual gifts. So man must not live for bread alone, but for every word that comes from the mouth of God, the word of God. So that ended the first temptation in which our Lord, the, just the first one, and then there are two more, uh, but that is where our Lord did not decide to use his deity and just uh, go outside of the spiritual life and turn stones into bread and really uh, destroy humanity and destroy going to the cross, which is what Satan wanted him to do. Last thing Satan wanted Christ to do was to go to the cross because after Jesus Christ uh, went to the cross and bore our sins, that was the strategic victory, which means it's uh, pretty much all over for Satan. The only thing he has left is the tribulation in which he'll try for three and a half years to create perfect environment, and then the last three and a half years, he will go nuts. He'll throw a temper tantrum, and uh, the, the streets will run with blood all over. But don't fret, we won't be here. We'll be in the presence of our Lord because the resurrection must occur first. And then comes uh, the uh, tribulation. So in the first test, Matthew, we'll take some points down for this. Point one. In the first test, Matthew 4, 3 through 4, Jesus had gone 40 days without food and was extremely hungry. So the humanity of Christ was tempted in relationship to the delegated power of God the Holy Spirit. That was delegated to him, the filling of God the Holy Spirit. It has also been delegated to us. Our Lord used doctrine, that is the Word of God. He used verses of doctrine. He used categories of doctrine in order to rebuff Satan, in order to say, well, here's some scripture I know. You're wrong. I'm right. And that is what he did from the use of the Word of God. So our Lord Jesus Christ used the word of God that he learned in the prototype spiritual life. And he grew in grace and in knowledge among men and in the sight of God, just as we do, the same way. Now, they didn't have pastor teachers then, but it was a, there was a different function of learning. And we note from Luke that he spent quite a considerable amount of time in the synagogue learning doctrine, and not only learning doctrine, but teaching it to some of the hypocrites who didn't know that much. And that was at the age of 12, our Lord Jesus Christ did that. And then evidence testing came at the age of 30. So if anybody uh, under the age of 30 comes up to you and says, I'm going through evidence testing, laugh at their face. <laughs> I heard somebody the other day say, I'm going through evidence testing. I wanted to laugh. I just wanted to uh, break out in hilarity. Jesus Christ was 30 years old when he went through. It takes a long, long, long time to get to that point. Most people never get there. They'll get through a momentum testing in four categories. And that's spiritual maturity, and you receive reward for it. Not as much as if you went through evidence testing, but you receive reward for it. And you receive reward for going to spiritual self-esteem. Not as much as if you go to spiritual maturity, but you receive reward. A little bit according to how far you've gone and so uh, evidence testing and that's when the devil really comes after you and that's when uh, you'll know it when you get to it it comes suddenly and uh, and if you've gone through some rough times well it maybe it's related to spiritual self-esteem or spiritual autonomy 
And if you go far enough, it will be evidence testing. But uh, now just think, if it took our Lord to age 30 before he was ready for evidence testing, now how long is it going to take for us with sin natures? Uh, quite a while. In his state of extreme hunger, uh, the Satan said, this is point two, in his state of extreme hunger, Satan said to him, if you are the Son of God, and you are, command these stones to be turned into bread. So Jesus Christ, as God, is infinite, eternal, immutable. Immutable means unchangeable. And um, the omnipotence and the creator of the universe. Remember, Jesus Christ, the second member of the Trinity, is actually the creator of the universe. That's found in Hebrews, as well as other passages. And uh, Satan recognized all of these things. As I've told you, uh, Jesus and Satan knew each other. Our Lord had the power to turn from his deity. He had the power to turn the entire universe to bread. Since he's the one who created the universe, well, he could just as easily turn it to bread from his deity. But remember, from Philippians, he humbled himself. And he, well, deprived himself of the utilization of these divine assets, or the, they weren't assets for him then, but of this uh, deity, deprived himself of it all. So under the doctrine of kenosis, which we've been studying, he did not use his omnipotence independently of God the Father. He refused to function independently of the Father's plan. It wasn't part of the Father's plan for Jesus Christ to turn the stones into bread. It was part of the Father's plan for Jesus Christ to use the eight problem-solving devices that he had along with the two power options. So that is what he used. He followed God's plan. And that's the same thing we use. Our Lord continued to be hungry. And this is point three. Our Lord continued to be hungry and met Satan's temptation with a quotation from Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 3. So he quoted a verse in the Bible. Meaning Jesus Christ knew scripture. Deuteronomy 8.3 Man shall not live by bread alone. Remember there was only an Old Testament during that time. No New Testament had been written. So Jesus Christ quoted from the Old Testament. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. By this what our Lord was saying is that he had established Bible doctrine number one priority in his life. Bible doctrine, number one priority in his life. So he used the power of the Word of God. And he used Deuteronomy 8.3 in order to uh, show Satan that the Word of God was more powerful than any temptation he could send the Lord's way. Point four. Or is it point one, two, three, four? What point am I on? Doesn't matter, just take this point. The temptation of Satan was designed to lure the humanity of Christ away from reliance upon the omnipotence of the Father for his logistical grace. Once again, the temptation of Satan was designed to lure the humanity of Christ away from reliance upon God the Father for his logistical grace. And just as we must rely on God the Father for our logistical grace, that is our food, our clothing, our water, our shelter, all of those things, we must rely on God for those. And he provides them to us. And in the same manner, Jesus Christ had to rely on logistical grace for his food, water, and clothing. Yet Jesus Christ had no place to lay his head. He was always on the move and he never had a place of his own. That's something right there to think about. Uh, but the temptation of Satan was designed to lure the humanity of Christ away from the reliance on uh, the plan of God the Father and reliance on God's logistical grace and also upon the staying power of God the Holy Spirit and on relying on the Word of God, which he knew uh, most definitely. Now, there are some false doctrines of kenosis that are out there. I doubt you will ever come across them, but I'll tell you about them just in case you ever do. They might teach it differently. Uh, they won't just say kenosis. For example, the Catholics uh, uh, teach uh, something completely different from kenosis. So uh, th there are three of them. First of all, there's the traditional view of kenosis. 
And that means that the attributes, the divine attributes of Christ, this is what they think, were surrendered during the first advent. Meaning that uh, when Jesus Christ came to the earth, automatically surrendered were some of the divine attributes. Not all of them, but some of them. So they say that it was uh, surrendered apart from his will. It's just something that happened. And to say that is to totally ignore Philippians. It's to totally ignore a verse in the, in the Bible. And these were called uh, uh, canonic the theologians. And canonic theologians hold that the Lagos, and Lagos in the Greek is referring to Jesus Christ, holds that the Lagos, Jesus Christ, through retaining his divine self-consciousness and his immutable, eminent, excuse me, eminent attributes, and the eminent attributes include holiness, love, and truth, surrendered his relative attributes. So they say, well, he kept his eminent attributes, he kept his uh, holiness, he kept his love, and he kept his truth, but he surrendered his omniscience, omnipresence, and uh, his omnipotence. But he didn't surrender either. Uh, he did not surrender the relative attributes, and we'll see why this is ridiculous in a moment. Then there's the second view, the Gnostic view. And this denies that Christ had a real body at all. The Gnostic view says that it was made from some heavenly substance instead of being a human being 100%. And he was 100% human being, along with 100% deity. And then the third one is the Lutheran view, and that denies that the incarnation uh, had any humiliation related to it. They didn't. Uh, they thought the incarnation was just part of the glorified Christ coming down to earth. Well, how ridiculous is that? Because also in Philippians it says in 2:8 that he humbled himself. So all of this is ignorance of Scripture or complete rejection of it. In, no, in most cases, these were the old theologians in which they were just starting to learn how to read, and it had to do with ignorance of the Word of God and incorrect translations and such as that. But they were trying. They just couldn't get there. But now we have the ability to bring it all together. Now there are objection, the objections to these false doctrines. Uh, for example, the traditional view where it says that he's that, that Jesus Christ uh, surrendered only the uh, only the relative attributes instead of the uh, the self the self consciousness and the eminent attributes, but he uh, gave up the relative attributes. And this would be ridiculous because if you surrender an attribute, you will change the character. If there is an attribute concerning yourself. Maybe you are someone with a, this is bringing it on human terms, but maybe you're someone with a phenomenal sense of humor. And everybody has always known you as somebody as being the funny guy or the class clown. And that's part of your attribute and your personality. Now, if suddenly one day you were to just take away that attribute and you were no longer the funny man, well, you've just changed your entire essence. You're no longer the class clown. You've changed. But we note from Hebrews 13.8, Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. So none of that was limited. It couldn't be. It would have changed him, but he's never changed. So these false doctrines are the result of ignorance or rejection of Scripture. And then uh, also there's no logical basis for distinguish, distinguishing between relative attributes and, at, and absolute attributes as being more or less essential to deity. That's like saying your, your uh, personality of being the funny man, uh, would uh, well, you would be no more or less a person without that personality. But everybody would recognize a change. But Jesus Christ, the same yesterday and forever. So that just blows right out of the water, these false concepts of kenosis. But the true concept is that Jesus Christ lived the unique spiritual life, and that is how he handled not only the temptation from Satan, this one found in Matthew 4, 1 through 4, 10, but also all the temptation to jump off the cross. And it was the spiritual life that gave him staying power. And it's the same spiritual life that will give you staying power in marriage, in friendships, in relationships in life. It's the same staying power that will get you through every testing in life, every financially bad situation, every success in life. So we have the same thing. 
And we must follow in Christ's footsteps and uh, follow uh, those very big footsteps in the snow. And it won't be burdensome. Just keep with the Word of God on a daily basis and learn these things and you'll be very adjusted to life. And in fact, you will be share the happiness of God and uh, actually share the happiness of Jesus Christ who was who had exhibited happiness on the cross while he was enduring all of the uh, the judgment of our sins. It's something that is uh, it's hard to a uh, I could uh, shout at a uh, hundred decibels and it wouldn't uh, make it any different except to give you an earache to let you know how how phenomenal this is. So with your heads bowed and your eyes closed, Father, we thank you for the wonderful privilege to study this portion of the Word of God. May we come to learn the importance of this spiritual life, and may we come to relate it to the fact that Jesus Christ lived the same spiritual life and was able to uh, do infinitely uh, more than we could ever ask or think on behalf of us and how we can live this spiritual life and receive infinitely above what we could ever ask or think including true happiness in life, including true capacity for love, for life, and for happiness. In Christ's name we ask it. Amen.